Hello. I thought I would give a summary on The Bruised Reed by Richard Sibbs. It's a small book, but it's a dense book. I found it was like trolling through a gold mine, like really good at every part, but it was a struggle to get through. So I've made this video to help give a summary and overview of what it's like. Um, as a bit of background, it was written in 1631 by a man called Richard Sibbs and it's based on the first three verses of Isaiah 42 which read as follows Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry out, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment on the truth. So the book is structured into three parts. The bruised reed, the smoking flax, and Christ's government in establishing his judgment in human hearts. Throughout the book, God, uh, Sibs magnifies the care and love of God by demonstrating man's weakness and dependency on him. So as we realize how small we are, this causes delight in us as we further realize just how gracious God's love is to us. So, bruised reeds, we're all bruised reeds, and sometimes we can feel this acutely. When you think of reeds, you might think of those rushes by the side of a lake. Um, well, the bruised reed is the one that's been trampled down or been flattened in a storm and is no longer standing proud. Sib says that the bruised reed is a man that for the most part is in some misery. This person has a poor opinion of themselves. <coughs> Perhaps they've been brought low by burdens in their life, but ultimately it's their sin that they should be feeling weighed down by. So this person isn't concerned with outward actions or appearances. They don't care what others think, but they grieve at the state of their inner condition. And so Sibs goes through the different reasons on why somebody might have been bruised. Maybe before someone is saved, the Holy Spirit brings down those high, arrogant thoughts that a person has of themselves. So they end up approaching God in humility. And in this state, God's love to them becomes even more incredible. You know, the smaller we see ourselves, the greater God becomes. And so the more we marvel at his love. To be brought low removes any pretenses that sin makes. Um, we are made weak and so drop the facade that we've been holding on to and we become honest through being exposed. Sometimes we may need bruising to remind us that we are not re that we are reeds and not oaks. Being bruised is useful to avoid pride and remain dependent on God instead of ourselves. What's also important to remember is that being bru bruised can also be an encouragement to others. So we might think of how Peter was bruised when he denied Christ three times. But then what an encouragement that is for the rest of us when we see Christ forgiving him even after those denials. You know, it was an encouragement for Peter, but also for us. Um, and that's a strong reminder that Christ will also forgive us when we go to him. People who see themselves as bruised reeds should take comfort, as it is weak people whom Christ came to save. He does not call those who find their burdens light, but those who are heavy laden. We should be encouraged that God is so well pleased with the work of redemption. We should remember that Jesus compared himself to a lamb and a hen to show his mildness, and that he does not turn any away that come to him. Christ will not break the reed or throw it away, but will cherish but will cherish it and strengthen the bruised believer. It is always worth remembering that there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. So the smoking flax. What is the smoking flax? Think of a candle that the flame has for whatever reason. There's no flame on it and there's smoke billowing off. There's just that little amber, that little glow, but then a lot of smoke coming off. Well, Sibs focuses on the fact that where there is smoke, there must at least be an am amber. And while that smoke is bad, it does reveal the presence of something burning. 
we should not be discouraged at the small beginnings of grace. Think about it this way. Even before it turns into a mighty oak, we would still call a little sapling a tree. If we are saved, if you have Christ in you, then it doesn't matter how immature your faith is, Christ will not leave you. And so the Christian must keep both eyes open. One to see imperfections in themselves and others, but also the other is open to see what is good. We should not do the work of Satan on his behalf in accusing ourselves and trying to disqualify ourselves from receiving the grace that God freely gives us. However, Sibs recognises that it is daunting to go to Christ when sin is intensely felt. It might be like Isaiah and we despair to go to God because we are too filthy to appear before him. And in a way, this feeling is right. Christ would be entirely just to reject those that come to him in their sin. Yet he did not and he does not. We see it again and again in the Gospels. The diseased, the demon-possessed, the sinful. When they go to him, Christ welcomes them with love and he heals them. He clears the smoke away and kindles the embers that are burning small within them. And as that fire grows, it burns cleaner and brighter. And even though we can know that this is true, it experientially feels that Christ is against us. And we might think of Matthew 15 when he's having a conversation with the Gentile woman. But we need to remember that Jesus only ever does this out of love and it makes way for a greater display of mercy. We might think of Joseph uh, appearing to be Benjamin's enemy when he hides his own cup in Benjamin's bag. Yet in the end, Joseph blesses Benjamin far more than any of the other brothers. And we are in Christ and Christ cannot forget himself. Faith pulls off the mask from his face to reveal a loving heart underneath. God often works by contraries. When he means to comfort, when he means to comfort, he will terrify first. And this is because he is always seeking the growth of our faith, the conforming of our character to Jesus's. And so whether through harsh word or gentle, he's working for our good. And then finally, Christ's government. He shall bring forth judgment on the truth. Christ does not establish his government in specific countries or through political structures, but in the heart of man. Other authorities can write laws, but only God can write them in people's hearts. As Christ has defeated sin, death and Satan on the cross, so he will overcome them in our hearts and consciences. And that can be very painful, as the heart previously being dead is now awakened and begins to feel the pain of its sin. This is because Christ establishes the presence of judgment and wisdom in the heart. Judgment is the life and soul of wisdom. And so you're able to discern both what is good and what is sinful. And you see how deep the whole of sin goes in our lives. The Christian is given these gifts of judgment and wisdom, not to be independent agents and to decide for themselves what to do, but so that they can make decisions knowing what God would have them do. Wisdom helps us see the world as God has made it. And to help keep the judgment of God clear on our hearts, we must set our affections right and ask God to shape our will. For judgment has no power over itself where the will is unsubdued. And we must remember our weakness as that will help keep us humble and dependent on God. But it's weird because thinking of Christ's government if you know Christ is president you'd expect unmitigated success and victory and yet this does not seem to be the case a lot of the time it can seem that others have the upper hand that Christ is being defeated and being shown to be weak for instance in Sib's times uh, true religion was being suppressed by the official corrupt church and as they were using religion like evilly to hold on to wealth and power. And in these times, it's important to remember that Christ conquered most when he suffered most. God flips the means of victory upside down. And so it is the weak that defeats the strong, the humble which humiliate the arrogant. Christ has secured victory at the cross. And now we can be assured that he will be glorified as he claims victory in the hearts of men. 
When man strives against God, it is easy to know what side the victory will be. So to sum up, Christ's government is shown to consist of bruised reeds and smoking flaxes. Those who are hurting and feel their own sin acutely. However, this only serves to glorify Jesus as the epitome of a gentle king. He accepts all who come to him, and only those who refuse him are kept out. The government, while made up of pathetic people in the eyes of the world, will be victorious over all other kingdoms and powers, because it is Christ's power which secures the result. At the same time, this power is being used to strengthen the reeds and ignite the flaxes, so they become more like him as they depend on him. So there you go, 11 minutes or so. That's a lot quicker than reading the book. I uh, hope this helps, and see you soon, whether cooking and running or doing something like this.